Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, to discuss our topic today, which is single injection hyaluronic acid and the treatment of knee osteoarthritis, examining the evidence. This was provided uh, by the North American Center for Continuing Medical Education, as well as uh, supported by an educational grant uh, from BioVentus. My name is Dr. Dasa. I'm Associate Professor of Clinical Orthopedics, Director of Research and Vice Chair of Academics with the LSU uh, Health Sciences Center in New Orleans, uh, Louisiana, and Department of Orthopedic Surgery. So today, uh, we're going to explore the use of single injection HAs, the treatment uh, algorithm for the management of NEOA. We'll identify a patient treatment factors that predict a favorable response uh, to intraarticular HA treatments to help guide uh, patient and treatment selection. We'll also examine the differences in efficacy, the science, and the clinical uh, application and duration of action of various uh, HA products on the market. So I think we all realize that the face of uh, NEOA is changing. And if you look, the patients are getting younger and more active uh, as the disease progression uh, moves forward. And we are now doing total knee replacements on patients uh, younger and younger uh, that maybe a decade or, or two decades ago we thought it would be unimaginable. Uh, doing a knee replacement in someone who is 50 or 55 years old. Um, one of the challenges is as the burden of total knee arthroplasty uh, increases, it's going to be placing a larger and larger burden on our providers, especially orthopedic surgeons, to really accommodate this uh, tsunami or this huge influx of surgeries uh, coming down the pipe. And if we look at the volume projections for total knee arthroplasty moving forward, you can see there's a tremendous uh, uh, increase in total hip and total knee replacements that are projected to move forward. So how do we try to flatten this curve out? Can we look at potential treatment options earlier in the process so that way we can flatten this curve out and make this a sustainable uh, procedure and a sustainable disease uh, progression? So the two key points here around uh, articular cartilage are the fact that it's a neural and avascular. There's a lot of uh, characteristics around cartilage, but really when we talk about kind of uh, engaging the patient, understanding why the patient comes and when they come, the two big points here is that it's avascular and aneural. So avascular is important in the, in the sense that cartilage has very poor ability to repair itself. So we need vascular supply, we need blood flow for the cartilage to be able to repair itself, and without that, we have significant issues uh, trying to get the articular cartilage uh, to heal. The other thing to think about is cartilage is a neural. Right? So we really don't know or really appreciate that there's damage to the cartilage until it's fairly progressive uh, along the disease severity. Right? Otherwise, if cartilage had nerve endings or uh, neurons within it, every time you took a step, it'd be painful. Right? So we can't necessarily have cartilage uh, have significant amount of innervation, like, for example, the tips of your fingers or your toes. And so really the majority of the sensation is within the subchondral bone. And so when articular cartilage wears out to the point where the bone below it begins feeling the forces, that's when patients start coming in for pain. But as you imagine, by then it's already pretty late in the process, right? So it's a double-edged sword where we don't want uh, people to obviously have pain every time they take a step, but at the same time, the problem we find, when we find out that there's a problem, it's fairly late uh, in the game. And so when we look at what cartilage is made out of, one of the biggest uh, components of this is uh, proteoglycans. Uh, we're gonna talk about this a little later uh, as it relates to HAs. But this is really the structure that allows articular cartilage uh, to have the compressive ability, absorb the forces, and really allow us to move our joints uh, smoothly as we move forward. So as OA progresses, there's a pretty uh, interesting and complicated uh, cellular and cell mechanistic pathway in terms of the progression of osteoarthritis. It's not simply you know, just wear and tear of uh, the cartilage. There's very complex biology that's going on here, mediated by uh, inflammatory cytokines, matrix metalloproteinases, and those are the degradative enzymes that break down the cartilage. So it's not necessarily the inflammation that's in the knee that's creating the, the breakdown of the cartilage and arthritic process. It's the enzymes that start degrading the cartilage that are induced by the inflammatory uh, cytokines and chemokines like IL-1, IL-6, and TNF-alpha. So you can see it's a fairly complicated uh, cellular uh, pathway that's still being worked on and uh, still we're trying to figure out exactly you know, where the opportunities are to intervene and, uh, and delay uh, this using various uh, treatment uh, options. So the way I describe uh, osteoarthritis to my patients, obviously it's, it's complex as I just showed you, but really for my day-to-day -day patients, the way I describe this is arthritis is basically like uh, wearing away the cartilage uh, in the turkey joint during Thanksgiving. So I say, 
Imagine uh, you think back to Thanksgiving, I snap open the turkey joint, you see that smooth, white, shiny stuff on the end of the bone? That's cartilage. Now imagine I took a fork and started scraping it away. That's arthritis. Now obviously the more severe the arthritis is, uh, the more painful it becomes where the two joint surfaces, uh, the bony surfaces are rubbing up against each other. So this is a picture of uh, two knees uh, that I took uh, during arthroscopy. And you can see on the left is what essentially a normal uh, knee, healthy looking knee looks like. So you can see the nice smooth articular cartilage on the uh, femoral condyle on the top. The tibial uh, cartilage is on the bottom, and this is what we hope to see in a healthy knee. Compare that to the arthritic knee, which is on the right, and you can see that even-mated bone. You can see that pink uh, uh, femoral condyle on the top. All the cartilage is worn away. You can see the meniscus uh, on the side there, completely macerated, and the articular cartilage on the tibia uh, starting to wear away. So this is an arthritic knee that's painful, and again, it's a very difficult to kind of regrow articular cartilage uh, on that bone and get that meniscus to heal up. And so these are the challenges uh, that we face uh, when it comes to arthritis. So how do we manage knee away? It's a fairly general paradigm here. You can see in the beginning when patients first engage the health system or maybe even on their own, uh, hopefully it's mild uh, knee away, uh, exercise, physical therapy, weight loss, uh, nutraceuticals. Uh, we'll get into that in a little bit. As knee away progresses, you can see we start getting a little more aggressive with analgesics and anti-inflammatories. Then as we move forward, you can see we start getting a little more complicated with intraarticular uh, treatments and then ultimately uh, surgery. So you can see where HA injections fit along the paradigm. Really, they generally fit and work well in patients with mild to moderate knee away. I think it's a little unrealistic to expect uh, these injections or any injection for that matter to work significantly well in patients with bone on bone knee away, which is the reason we have total joint replacement. So HA injections really work well to mild to moderate OA, and you'll see because of that how the research has evolved from uh, in the past where uh, a lot of patients were uh, with bone-on-bone -bone OA or some more severe OA were included in some of the initial studies to, to the newer studies where we're starting to focus on mild to moderate knee OA because we know that's where the opportunity is uh, to really intervene uh, meaningfully. So when we take x-rays of the knee, the key here is understanding what the importance is of the different x-rays in the knee. So my screening x-rays are four. It's the uh, standing uh, lateral view, sunrise view or merchant view, uh, standing AP view, and the standing uh, notch and tunnel view. The tunnel view or the Rosenberg views are an AP x-ray of the knee taken with the knee flexed about 45 degrees so we can bring into profile that area of the knee where we would expect the cartilage to be worn out. So I'm going to point that out uh, with these two uh, x-rays here where on the X-rays you can see on the left, uh, you see the impact of weight-bearing versus non-weight-bearing. Same patient, different X-rays. So the X-ray on the left, same patient laying on the table, you can see there's reasonable amount of joint space. So you'd led, you'd be, you could be led to believe that the arthritis in this knee is fairly minimal. But look what happens when I ask the patient to stand and I take the X-ray. That compartment of the knee completely collapses down. And you've got bone-on-bone -bone arthritis. So in one scenario on the left, where the patient is responding to treatments, whether it's injections or anti-inflammatories, what have you, we kind of throw our hands up in the air and we end up blaming the patient. But if we get the proper x-rays and we get the patient to stand, look what happens. We see complete uh, collapse of that space. So when you circle AP, uh, sorry, when you circle two views of the knee on your uh, diagnostic imaging form, you give it to the patient, they're going to go down to get their x-rays. What happens? Typically, the x-ray tech will lay them supine on the x-ray table and shoot an AP and knee x-ray. And what do you get? You get what I've just demonstrated here, the artificial distraction. So you really have to specify we want these x-rays standing or in a functional position so we can really appreciate what's going on. The x-ray on the right shows the impact of that Rosenberg view of the tunnel or notch view. So on the left x-ray, you can see standing AP in the x-ray. looks like a reasonable amount of joint space. But on the far right there, when I get the patient to flex about 45 degrees, what do you see? Complete collapse of that compartment. Right? So what's going on here? We're simply asking the patient to flex their knee about 45 degrees, shoot that same x-ray, and we see complete loss of cartilage. So what's going on is when we're walking, do we spend most of our times walking peg leg straight? No. We spend most of our lives uh, uh, in a little bit of flexion. Right? So what do we expect? We expect that cartilage to wear out along the posterior aspect of the femur. And so unless we get the x-rays to bring that area into profile, we potentially are going to miss out on the severity of disease, as you, as you see here, right? So I was sitting on the plane uh, and look, leafing through the back of the, uh, the magazine, 
And what did I find? I found uh, this advertisement uh, promoting some type of laser treatment or something like that. And look at the x-rays that they use, right? My suspicion is the first x-ray on the right was taken with the patient laying down. And the x-ray on the left was taken with the patient standing up. And you see that complete collapse of the articular cartilage. So this is what it looks like clinically. So again, you can see this is uh, from one of my total knee replacements. Look at the x-ray on the left. You can make an argument. The joint spaces look pretty good. Why the heck is this patient going for knee replacement? Why are they failing injections? Why aren't NSAIDs working? We don't understand what's going on here. But look what happens here. When I took a picture during surgery, that the entire condyle of that posterior aspect of the femur was completely worn out, right? So we have to bring into profile that area of the knee or that area of the femur where we'd expect the articular cartilage to be. So if we can't diagnose it properly, then we're really going to struggle treating the pro uh, patient uh, properly. So the challenge is this. Our paradigm around management of knee OA is, is fairly archaic, right? And so most of us, this is the extent of uh, what we do. So uh, Tylenol, uh, Advil, Aleve, uh, what have you, uh, we know Patients are getting uh, sicker. They're on all kinds of uh, anticoagulation medicines. They've got hypertension. They've got renal disease, this, this, and this. So a lot of our initial armamentarium is starting to disappear. So then what do we do? We lean on steroid injections. Steroid injections don't work. Then we jump to surgery, right? So the challenge here is really uh, introducing you to all the various options that are out there beyond that these kind of simple uh, treatments have kind of been the standard of care for, for quite some time. So this is a nice algorithm uh, that kind of walks through all the different options to manage uh, NeoA. And so this is a good reference to maybe uh, print out and, and uh, stick in your office or uh, hand out to patients or what have you to understand, uh, kind of walk you through almost like a checklist of what the uh, options are uh, to manage uh, NeoA. So let's go through some of this. So one of the more common ones I get asked about is knee bracing. So here are a couple studies uh, looking at the impact of knee bracing. One uh, on the top there is actually a thigh sleeve. Uh, that goes above the patella, looked at uh, especially anterior knee pain, uh, which had some benefit. On loader brace, we get asked about a lot whether you're knock kneed or bow legged, varus or valgus, to wear an on loader brace uh, would do the patient's benefit. And this study showed the patients do benefit. The problem is these braces are so bulky, about 80% of the patients throw them in the closet after about two years. So while they work, they're really not practical uh, from a long term management perspective. And so really, you know, braces are uh, useful, knee sleeves are useful up to a certain point, and then uh, patients uh, struggle with them. So what about uh, vitamins and nutritional uh, supplements? So not really wonderful research, uh, level one, uh, high grade uh, research here, but if you're gonna use them, again, my general rule of thumb for my patients is if they're not gonna hurt you and they can potentially help you, then fine. But again, as OA severity progresses, don't expect a whole lot uh, from these types of supplements. Um, so as long as you educate your patients properly and they understand uh, what to expect, you know, I think these are reasonable. So antioxidants like turmeric, we've got glucosamine chondroitin, you can see vitamins A, C, D, and E. Again, mild to moderate uh, pain relief. You've got to take them for a while. I tell my patients, especially around glucosamine chondroitin, you've got to take it for maybe about uh, two to three months. And then if you stop, well, some of the patients will say, then they feel the difference. So it's very gradual, it's incremental, um, and some patients do get benefit uh, with that. Uh, as far as medications go, these are the workhorse medications. Obviously, uh, most of us are fairly uh, comfortable and knowledgeable about this. Aspirin, ibuprofen, naproxen. Again, remember uh, GI and cardiovascular uh, effects. And then obviously, narcotics has become a real big issue uh, for us here in the U.S. And so specifically around glucosamine chondroitin, this is a nice uh, summary article out of uh, one of the orthopedic uh, journals. If you're going to use glucosamine chondroitin, it's 1,500 milligrams of glucosamine, glucosamine and 1,200 milligrams of uh, chondroitin, again, for about two to three months. Low adverse effect profile, uh, GI distress. Again, the, the studies around this are, are fairly inadequate, very little consistency between all the various uh, research studies out there, the significant uh, placebo effect as well. So this was an interesting study of the Lewington Journal of Medicine. So the premier journal around you know, healthcare and, and uh, clinical research, right? And so when you looked at this study, they only required the patient to have one single AP knee x-ray. So the AP knee x-ray that they used was the KL score. So the KL score is a single one-view AP knee x-ray uh, taking it with the knee uh, head on. And this was a study, or the KL score was first published in the uh, late 50s, early 60s. And back then they said we were unable to do more than one uh, x-ray for the knee 
for fear of uh, excess radiation. And so they came up with the KL score just based on that one AP knee x-ray, right? And I showed you an example of what happens when you flex the knee and you get, uh, you start bringing into profile that area of the femur that you'd expect the articular cartilage uh, to wear out. So this study more than likely enrolled a fair number of patients with more severe disease that they didn't appreciate because of that single uh, KL score. And what did they find here? Glucosamine chondroitin really uh, had a no significant uh, benefit uh, compared to placebo. The, but the problem is, if you include patients with bone-on-bone -bone arthritis, there's no hope of anything being better than placebo because really the only thing that's going to work is surgery and knee arthroplasty. So my point with this is when you're looking at the research, you really have to do a deeper dive than just simply looking at the abstract. You have to get into the materials and methods and really look at it critically and say, you know, does this make sense? Does this really fit the patient population? Does the methodology uh, make sense that I'm going to change my practice? Now, obviously, when it comes to anti-inflammatories, uh, we have a lot of caution around this with black box uh, warnings. Uh, a lot of primary care physicians are worried about uh, uh, increased uh, hypertension. Uh, you can see uh, the impact of NSAID uh, overuse uh, with uh, deaths. Four times more Americans die from NSAID annually than cervical cancer. And you can see the other statistics there. Now, I think we've gotten better over the years at managing NSAIDs and really dialing down what the patients use, but we have no control of that really on the over-the-counter side of this, where patients, you know, I've had patients say they take 6, 8, 10, 20 uh, uh, pills a day, depending on uh, how bad they feel. So it's in the lay press. Everybody's struggling with figuring out uh, how to handle this. You know, sometimes we're picking the lesser of two evils uh, in certain scenarios, right? So it's a challenge for us to kind of manage this. So we've got to grow our toolbox. We've got to uh, in increase our toolkit here so we can uh, make a dent and really help our patients. I get asked a lot about topical versus uh, oral anti-inflammatory, so this was a nice summary out of AHRQ. Really, the trade-off here is on the oral side, there's uh, side effects. On the topical side, there's side effects. So basically, which side effect or which problem do you want? Pick your poison, if you will. And so on the oral side, obviously, the GI, hypertension, so on and so forth. On the topical side, a lot of skin issues and, and uh, dermat dermatologic uh, reactions uh, with that. So this was a nice uh, uh, meta-analysis looking at all the different treatment options around NeoA. And interestingly enough, they found that paracetamol uh, really had no benefit in management of uh, NeoA. And if we looked at all the medications out there, diclofenac uh, had the best uh, uh, outcome and the uh, best uh, relief uh, compared to all of them. So what about narcotics? Now, obviously, opiates are a huge issue for us uh, here in the U.S., uh, and it's been in the lay press and, uh, you know, was declared a national emergency uh, by the president. And so what are we going to do about that? Now, obviously, in the past, uh, we, we were much more willing to use narcotics uh, to manage NEOA. Uh, that that uh, has since changed. And now we're starting to see new data in the orthopedic literature coming out, really doing a deeper dive into the impact of narcotics uh, on our patients. And so we have a, a tremendous amount of research coming out, really talking about risks around narcotics uh, in surgery. So if you look at knee OA, patients with narcotics going into a total knee or total hip, higher risk of dissatisfaction, readmission, complications postoperatively compared to those patients that were never on narcotics going in, let alone all the other issues that opiates and narcotics uh, bring. So after that, we've got steroid injections, which are kind of the tried and true workhorse uh, treatment for knee OA. Really, they're meant for mild to moderate, moderate to severe uh, NeoA, they come in really a crystalline and a less soluble uh, form versus uh, less crystalline and more soluble form, uh, which you see there, about three to four injections a year. Really no significant side effects or issues uh, around, uh, surrounding uh, steroids in, in terms of the acute injection-based problems. So there are a number of different uh, steroid formulations that are out there. Uh, the more crystalline the steroid, the more insoluble it is, the longer the residence time, okay? So the less soluble, or sorry, the more soluble it is, the less crystalline it is, the more systemic absorption you get. So these are some of the issues you have to think about when someone has diabetes, for example, or which steroid formulation you're going to use uh, in the office. So trimcinolone or Kenalog is the most crystalline or the most insoluble. So that hangs out in the knee uh, for longer and potentially has longer uh, local effect. Okay. So we did a study uh, at, Louis, uh, at LSU because I wanted to look at the differences uh, between uh, rheumatologists and orthopedic surgeons in terms of their uh, steroid injections. 
Uh, oftentimes, when we come out into practice, we essentially adopt uh, the steroid cocktail that our last uh, faculty used. Uh, and so what I was finding is, even within my own group, all of the orthopedic surgeons were doing uh, their own steroid injection. Uh, and then when I talked to the rheumatologist, they were all doing their own thing, too. And I wanted to get a handle on who's doing what uh, and understand kind of what the standard uh, was. I was wondering if there even was a standard uh, steroid injection cocktail. And the other thing to point out is very rarely do we inject pure steroids. Oftentimes it's steroids mixed with an analgesic. And so we surveyed the, the Louisiana orthopedic surgeons and uh, rheumatologists. And what we found was the most common uh, steroid use was trimcinolone, and the most common analgesic used was uh, lidocaine. Now, when we asked what combination uh, did they use, what was interesting is we found 22 different steroid analgesic cocktails uh, that were out there between orthopedic surgeons and rheumatologists. But the most common one uh, was trimcinolone and uh, lidocaine. The other thing that we asked was, how much volume do you inject uh, into the knee? And what we found that was interesting is rheumatologists inject two cc's of stuff. So usually uh, one cc of steroid and one cc of analgesic. Orthopedic surgeons generally injected five cc's. So one cc of steroids and four cc's of the analgesic. In my practice, I actually inject 10 cc's into the knee, uh, one cc of steroids, and then uh, nine cc's of the analgesic. So one thing to think about, you know, we use uh, steroid injections fairly uh, liberally in uh, most everybody, partly because it's, it's cheap and, and it's effective. But have we really stopped to look at the potential biologic effect of this, right? Does it really make sense taking one of the most powerful drugs that are out there, steroids, right? We use it in the ICU. We use it in all kinds of really e extreme situations. Take such a strong medication, inject it in a confined space like the knee, and then expect only good things to happen, right? Uh, obviously, that would be great, but odds are life isn't uh, that simple. And so let's look at a, do a little deeper dive at the impact of steroid injections. So at a clinical level, um, one thing to think about is the impact of steroid injections in our diabetics. So we get uh, transient uh, hyperglycemia. Uh, and so especially with the more soluble uh, uh, medications, I've got uh, patients that report back to me, they had a blood glucose of 300 or 400, four or five days uh, even after the steroid injection. Some of the research says it should only be 24 hours, but uh, I've had a different uh, experience with some of my uh, patients. And then we're going to look at the impact of steroid injections uh, before uh, total knee replacement uh, a little later. So steroid injections in the context of joint replacements, there have been a couple studies with conflicting results. And so this is a study looking at the impact of steroid injections uh, par prior to surgery and seeing a, a significant increase of infection uh, prior to arthroplasty. And they were advocating for doing these injections more than 90 days out uh, from surgery. And then other studies showing really no impact of uh, steroid injections uh, prior, prior to uh, total joint replacement. So it's really conflicting uh, data out there about uh, whether or not steroid injections do cause a problem. So it's a something to think about if you're going to inject, uh, knowing if the patients are going to have an upcoming surgery, just to pause and, and let everybody decide if that's the right option for the patient, given the uh, conflicting results uh, that are out there. So what about steroid injections on the local biology? So we have to understand when we do these injections, what the impact is around the local biology around the knee. So there are a number of studies out there looking at uh, steroid injections on articular cartilage cells. So some of these studies, they take uh, slivers of articular cartilage, they expose them to steroids, and then they look to see how the cartilage cells are behaving. And some of these cases, when you add the steroid plus the analgesic, you see almost 80% cell death within one day of the steroid plus the uh, analgesic uh, combination. So we have to understand what's going on with the local biology when we give these injections and really uh, be careful when we give these, or at least let the patients know what the potential harm uh, could be. Some studies out there looking at the impact of steroids on stem cells and ligaments. So this was an interesting study looking at the impact of dexamethasone on patellar tendon stem cells. And so when these stem cells were exposed to steroids, they were then pushed into a, a lineage or differentiation away from stem cells into adipogenesis, right? So you take these patella tendon stem cells that were on the way to becoming new uh, patella tendon uh, tissue, you expose them to steroids, and then all of a sudden they make a right turn and start turning into fat. 
So in the context of tissue regeneration, let's say microfracture, some of the other uh, treatments that we're trying to do to really prolong uh, the life of the joint, we really have to understand what's going on at a biological and cellular level with some of the more common treatments that we use. So we had a great idea of using constant uh, infusion bupivacaine pumps uh, for our shoulder scopes. So patient had rotator cuff tear, we'd put uh, these bupivacaine pumps with the uh, catheter going directly into the joint, uh, patient would leave the surgery center completely pain-free. Everybody was happy, and lo and behold, some of these patients were coming back with excruciating uh, shoulder pain. And what was going on? We found chondrolysis, or death of the articular cartilage. What was happening is the patients were developing bone-on-bone -bone, uh, shoulder arthritis because of the chondrotoxicity of the local analgesic that was going into the shoulder. So these patients were young, healthy people coming in for rotator cuff or some kind of surgery, and actually ending up with a shoulder replacement because we thought we were actually doing good by injecting the shoulder with uh, this analgesic medicine. So I just Googled the term chondrolysis in Google uh, one day, and look what happened. A bunch of lawyers popped up on the uh, sponsored action of uh, Google, right? So we have to be careful and really understand what we're doing and what impact it has on the local biology. So this is a study uh, looking at the impact of reticular uh, steroids on cartilage. So this was a study where patients uh, had uh, steroid injections every three months for two years, and then the patients had a follow-up MRI. And look what happens. The patients that got steroid injections compared to saline injections had no benefit in terms of clinical outcome, and then had articular cartilage volume loss as measured by MRI after two years, right? So you're starting to see clinical evidence really supporting the basic science uh, that was proven out years ago. So point here again is we have to be careful uh, with understanding what's going on at the local uh, biological level, right? So there are other studies looking at the impact of reticular cartilage. You know, is this the end of the world? We got to stop doing steroid injections. No, we've been giving steroid injections forever and patients overall have do been doing well. And so there's some studies showing, you know, that it potentially in terms of the anti-inflammatory effect could potentially help protect the knee. The challenge is, is we don't know what the right, right dose of steroid injection is uh, for a knee, right? And that's gonna vary based on patient size, whether they have enough effusion. So it's gonna create, or we're gonna have to create some kind of complex formula so we understand the exact dosing that's needed for a knee or shoulder uh, or what have you. And that data and that information isn't coming anytime soon, right? So in the context of the information that we've got now, we have to really understand and appreciate uh, what the impact is of steroids and the analgesics uh, that we give. So next option after that would be HA injection. So what exactly is hyaluronic acid? How does it work? What are the controversies surrounding this? And then uh, where does this fit in our treatment option? So HA is a polysaccharide repeating disaccharide uh, that's found interestingly um, in, in all animal species. And it's a very interesting molecule in that it's one of the very few molecules that's completely preserved across all animal species. So whether you're a chicken, you're a bacteria, or a human, I can move this molecule between species and really have no impact on the reaction uh, to this molecule. But the catch is it has to be purified, right? So if I'm going to take it from another species, I really have to purify it and make it as pure of a molecule as possible to make sure that the next species that is exposed to it uh, doesn't have a reaction uh, to it. And so it's found intrinsically uh, within the knee joint. Uh, there, the initial of these done uh, really were from a mechanical impact of these injections uh, in the knee, uh, but later studies, which we'll get into, have really shown a significant uh, biological impact of these injections uh, in the knee. So again, as I mentioned earlier, really the biggest thing that we're trying to prevent or reduce is the matrix metalloproteinases uh, within the knee. So yes, we want to get rid of the inflammation. Yes, we want to get rid of the effusion. But really, the, the, the main thing that's breaking down the articular cartilage in the knee are the MMPs and the matrix metalloproteinases. So if we can suppress or reduce the impact of these, then we have the potential to slow down uh, the natural history and the uh, disease progression. And so uh, when you look at HA, there's a number of different uh, biologic and physiologic imp impacts here uh, from uh, protecting the cartilage to uh, stimulating uh, the body to make more endogenous, uh, normal uh, proteoglycans and glycosaminoglycans. Uh, it's got a significant anti-inflammatory uh, uh, effect. 
The mechanical properties of it are important, but that's kind of older literature, but really it's the biological uh, impact that we're starting to see uh, uh, and, and understand more clearly uh, that we see the, uh, we think the explanation for the clinical results uh, some of the studies are showing. And then its impact on subchondral bone uh, and uh, pain receptors. And so in terms of uh, articular cartilage, uh, you can see here a number of basic science studies uh, looking at the impact of HAs. The one I want to point your attention to is in the middle, which is uh, its impact on meniscus cells. Now, when we look clinically, interestingly enough, you, we don't or we are not doing that many total knee replacements on patients with tibial plateau fractures or fractures around the knee. You'd think if the damage to the articular cartilage from a fracture is significant enough that the patients would develop post-traumatic arthritis uh, pretty quickly. But very rarely do many orthopedic surgeons, total joint replacement uh, surgeons, do total knee replacements on patients with previous uh, tibial plateau fractures, which is kind of interesting, right? Whereas in other joints uh, in the knee or in the body, whether it's the hip or the ankle, if you have a fracture there and that cartilage is disrupted, you develop tremendous post-traumatic arthritis uh, fairly quickly, but not so in the knee. So what's different about the knee? Well, the, the unique uh, anatomic portion of the knee uh, that allows it to be different from some of these other more constrained joints is the meniscus. So if we look, the number of patients that are getting a knee replacement after a meniscus tear or partial meniscectomy is significantly higher compared to patients that had the tibial plateau fracture, right? We see that clinically. So what is it about the meniscus? Well, the, the meniscus essentially acts like a shock absorber in the knee, and that's actually what's protecting the knee more than anything, right? It increases the surface area of the knee, it absorbs a lot of the forces. And so if we can preserve the meniscus, then we have the potential to really uh, delay the natural progression uh, of arthritis in the knee. So this study looked at the impact of hyaluronic acid on the meniscus cells in the knee. And what it demonstrated was HA actually preserves and protects the meniscus cells in the knee, which is huge in terms of trying to slow down a disease progression uh, and subsequently a total joint replacement. When we look at the impact of HAs, in the synthesis of proteoglycans and glycosaminoglycans, essentially as stimulating more normal hyaluronic acid. One of the things that happens as we go, grow older and, uh, and the OA uh, disease progresses is the concentration and the volume of and the molecular size of HA diminishes uh, as we get older and OA progresses. And so if we can stimulate the body to make more normal endogenous HA, so normal sized molecules with the same uh, concentration, then we have the ability to start preserving the lifespan uh, of that knee. So when it comes to inflammation, you can see there's a fairly complex uh, pathway uh, mediated by the CD44 receptor that the uh, HA uh, binds to uh, to reduce the inflammatory uh, cascade and process uh, within the joint. And so this was an interesting study, Alice, out of uh, LSU Shreveport, looking at the impact of uh, human uh, synovial tissue. So what they did was, uh, this was the Waddell study, they took uh, human synovial tissues from patients uh, undergoing total knee replacements uh, and uh, ACL surgery and things like that. They stimulated the synovium with IL-1, so kind of revved it up. Then they introduced hyaluronic acid. And what they found was a tremendous um, uh, suppression of pro-inflammatory -infl uh, cytokines like IL-1. But more importantly, what they did was they measured the MMPs, matrix metalloproteinases, and they had statistically and clinically significant reduction in the MMP production uh, after exposure to hyaluronic acid, right? And so you can see in these basic science studies, we're starting to paint the picture that HA injections suppress inflammation, and then on top of that, reduce, more importantly, uh, the production of the degradative enzymes, uh, matrix, uh, the various matrix uh, metalloproteinases. The other, uh, more uh, along the cellular mechanism uh, perspective, it's the impact of HA injections on uh, apoptosis and uh, chondrocyte uh, proliferation. So again, if we can reduce the matrix metalloproteinase production, we uh, reduce cell death. Now, the mechanical uh, discussion, interestingly, uh, is fairly old, uh, and uh, we've kind of evolved uh, from some of this. HAs are actually classified by the FDA in the United States as a device because some of the original research and thinking around HA injections was the fact that it was providing, a, a, being a mechanical lubricant uh, within the knee and uh, decreasing the friction. So you can see some of the research here surrounding that, uh, but we know now there's a fair amount of biology going on here in addition to the mechanical properties. We talked about uh, how uh, patients start feeling or realizing that they've got uh, pain in the knee. 
So you can see that the HA injections also help change the characteristics of the subchondral bone because that's actually where the patients are feeling uh, the impact of the articular cartilage loss. So it's not necessarily from the cartilage itself, but it's the transmission of the, of the forces as the cartilage wears away to the subchondral bone. And you can see here that the HA impacts uh, the uh, microarchitecture of the subchondral bone as well. This next study, uh, next couple of studies look at the impact of HAs on pain. So they had an animal model here. They caused uh, inflammation and pain within the joint. Then they harvested the dorsal ganglia from the animals and looked at the receptors in there. And the animals that were exposed to HAs had a downregulation uh, of the uh, receptors uh, and subsequently had a decreased uh, perception of pain. So you can see here from a cellular basic science uh, mechanistic pathway, the mechanism of action of HAs is pretty well mapped out across all the different uh, parameters that we would find uh, clinically relevant. So that's the basic science. So how does the basic science fit in the context of what all the research, uh, all the uh, societies feel around uh, usefulness of HA uh, injections? And we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, clinical evidence uh, around this. And there's a fair amount of controversy that's now evolved around this. And it's somewhat confusing, too, because different societies and different sets of experts feel differently about this injection. The one that created the largest waves uh, recently was the AAOS guidelines around the uh, non-operative management of NEOA back in 2013. And if we look at all the treatment options that uh, the guideline uh, really promotes, there's really only four uh, treatments for NEOA that had uh, evidence to support their use. So exercise, weight loss, NSAIDs, and osteotomy. Right? So for most of us practicing clinical medicine, I think we'd all agree telling our patients to simply exercise, lose weight, and take anti-inflammatories, you probably wouldn't have much of a practice. So most of the patients coming to my practice have already failed these options, right? So the three uh, options that are supported by the evidence, most of us don't even have that option to do. And if I told most of my patients uh, you should do this, they'd, they'd look at me. They'd say, why am I even here? Right? Osteotomies is really not that practical for a uh, majority of our patients. So if you think about it using the AAS guidelines, there's really nothing in the green section that's clinically useful. Right? If you look at steroid injections, that's yellow. So there's no information for or against steroid injections. Narcotics are still considered neutral. Right? So this day and age, opiates and narcotics are officially, by the 2013 guidelines, considered not good or bad. Right? And HA injections were found uh, to be negative. So if we look at some of these guidelines from a very practical clinical perspective, they, they don't give us that much information because you know, the evidence and the research, uh, depending on how you look at it, is useful or not useful. So the academy really had a different way or a new way of looking uh, statistically at the research, which some of the other research societies did not. So if we look at the American College of Rheumatology, where do they stand? So if you look at, that, at their findings, they actually recommend the use of intraarticular uh, HAA injections uh, for the treatment of uh, OA. If we look at ARC, AHRQ, you can see they found the same thing in their review, that HAA injections are useful uh, for patients and may actually delay uh, total knee replacement, and we'll get into that in a little bit. The American uh, Society for Sports Medicine recommends the use of HAA injections for knee OA. If we look at Eurovisco, so this is a group of uh, experts uh, within Europe, uh, unanimous agreement that visco supplementation uh, HA injections are effective but treatment for mild to moderate NEOA. And then if you look at ORSI, uh, which is the uh, research body uh, around uh, NEOA, uh, you can see that they have a neutral recommendation on the use of HAs for NEOA. So double, the AAOS was against. You had a number of uh, specialty societies and experts uh, recommending for it or had a neutral recommendation for it. So it's fairly complicated to get our hands around this. And what's some of the challenges? Why are these specialty societies and, and societies finding all these uh, different acceptance rates for HA? And part of the challenge is going back to the original diagnosis uh, of HA, the Kellgren-Lawrence uh, grading system, which was used uh, way back when to do all the OA studies, even up until now, many of the OA studies are done uh, in this uh, X-ray criteria, is one standing AP knee X-ray, right? And I showed you what happens when patients only get one standing AP knee X-ray. You lose the ability to really understand uh, who uh, has what amount of OA severity, and you start enrolling patients into these studies that actually have fairly significant disease, 
which is why they were barely better than placebo, right? If patient has bone on bone knee away, guess what? There's really no treatment that's going to be that much better than placebo because nothing is better than a joint replacement in those patients that are symptomatic with severe uh, knee away. So, you know, we're, we're, we're not necessarily answering the questions that we need. And so some of the pitfalls, especially around the KL scoring system, again, is its inability to really uh, properly screen for knee away, its insensitivity uh, to change. It has, you have no ability to look at the patellofemoral joint. If you look at most of the patients that come to our office, where do they point to in terms of where their pain is? They, they grab the top of their knee around the kneecap, right? So OA really in a lot of patients starts in the patellofemoral compartment, the anterior compartment where the kneecap sits in the trochlear groove, which is why that merchant viewer sunrise is extremely important because oftentimes you'll see advanced disease or disease starting in the patellofemoral joint before you see it uh, between the femur and tibia. And when we do the KL score, uh, that we don't look at that. We don't look at the patellofemoral joint. We don't get the flexed uh, notch view to pick up on the severity of disease, especially where we'd expect it to be along the your condyles. So again, since the KL score is used for a lot of the older research, you can see why uh, some of the uh, specialty societies and uh, uh, guidelines uh, are kind of relying on uh, research that uh, wasn't necessarily as robust uh, as we need it to be. So again, depending on how you interpret the literature and how deep a dive you do into literature to really understand the methodology really will impact uh, your opinion and how you feel uh, the various treatment options around NEOA should be used. So in terms of NEOAs, kind of the, the, the growth and the uh, interest uh, more recently over the last few years has been around uh, single injection HAs. Typically, you've got a, a spectrum of options. They have uh, single injection HAs one time, up to five times, uh, one injection a week uh, for five weeks. They can vary in terms of their molecular weight, low molecular weight versus high molecular weight. And we'll get into uh, differences there. Uh, because remember, as long as you don't screw around with the molecule, the body doesn't react to it. You don't have difficulties later on. And so with some of the high molecular weight uh, options out there, uh, you start to see some of these allergic responses uh, to the injection, uh, which then can become problematic uh, for the patient. And there's a lot of interest now recently in uh, generating or creating HAs that are non-avian based, especially for patients that have allergies uh, to chicken protein and things like that. Uh, can we get away from some of the avian based uh, formulations and move to the non-avian based? Uh, again, the changes that you would expect as science and uh, medicine understands uh, over time more and more uh, the impact of these injections uh, in different scenarios. So if we look at the uh, different HA injections that are out there, there's a tremendous uh, uh, number of these products on the market in various countries and in here in the U.S. Uh, the ones with the green arrows there are the single uh, injection uh, HAs that are on the market uh, that are gaining a lot of momentum, uh, especially here in the United States. So what does the research show uh, around HA injections, single injection uh, versus the uh, multiple injections? So this was a head-to-head -head study uh, comparing uh, Duralane, which is one of the more recent uh, single in injection uh, HA products in the U.S., to ARTS, or otherwise known as SUPARTS, uh, here in the U.S. So this was a 26-week non-inferiority study, essentially comparing a single injection to a, the standard kind of uh, uh, tried-and-true grandfather uh, injection, if you will, uh, SUPARTS. So this was a study uh, conducted in China. Again, head-to-head -head study, Duralane versus SUPARTS. You can see uh, patients' uh, ages there. And the important thing here now, and we're starting to see these studies, really make sure that they're not including patients with bone-on-bone -bone arthritis like they did in the past. And specifically here, this study only wanted to look at patients with mild to moderate uh, knee away, so a KL score of two and three. Uh, and they wanted the patients to have a baseline uh, pain and function score uh, so you can pick up on the differences that we need to pick up on. So this study was designed with five weekly injections of uh, SUPARTS versus uh, one injection of Duralane followed by four weekly uh, sham injections or uh, fake injections, if you will. You can see almost equivalent uh, patients in each group. Uh, primary analysis was out to uh, 26 weeks. And you can see the uh, uh, outcome variables uh, that they were capturing, uh, Womack pain and function, which is uh, among the typical, more typical uh, uh, common uh, OA uh, outcomes uh, that we measure. And then uh, you can see the responder rate uh, that they looked at uh, as it relates to rescue medications uh, as well. And so what they found was essentially no difference between the single injection uh, Duralane product compared to the uh, five injection uh, SUPARTS product, no difference in the group at baseline and then out to uh, 26 weeks. And you can see that there was no uh, difference in rescue medication uh, loose usage uh, for either of those. Adverse event uh, rates were low uh, and uh, similar uh, to both. So really the single injection uh, products 
are uh, bioequivalent, if you will, uh, to the multi-injection uh, products. And so uh, from a clinical perspective, uh, fairly uh, interchangeable. So if we look at the uh, single injection products uh, on the market, all of these are here in the U.S. except for uh, Arthrum. Uh, and you can see how these injections stack up to each other. The point I want to bring up here is the cross-linking that occurs with the different products that are out there. So remember, as long as I don't mess around with the molecule, okay, I can move it from species to species, so a bacteria to a human. So purify it, move it to the next species, if you will, inject it, and you should be fine. But what some of the companies do in order to make it a single injection, right, so it has the duration of relief uh, that everybody's looking for instead of five injections, they have to start cross-linking the molecule. So when you start cross-linking it inappropriately where the body doesn't recognize it as being normal, you start getting reactions to it. And so in some of the products, because of the way they cross-link it and some of the chemicals that they use, the body gets a reaction to that injection and you get what's called a pseudoseptic uh, response where the knee blows up, it gets red, swollen. And the original days of HA injections, when it first came to market, we really didn't understand what was going on. And so when patients got this allergic response uh, to the injection, in the beginning, we're actually taking the patients back to the operating room thinking it was infected. But over time, we realized that's actually a reaction to the cross-linking in some patients. And so now what happens is physicians now have to either uh, pre-medicate or post-medicate or inject with uh, steroids uh, the, some of these HA products. So you have to be careful and understand which ones are cross-linked because the ones that are stabilized and non-cross-linked really have less of an issue uh, with that reaction uh, compared to the ones uh, that are cross-linked at a biological level. So again, you have to do your homework. You really have to understand what's going on at a basic science, cellular, biological level, so you make the right decision uh, for your patients. And so we did a study uh, to look at where HA injections uh, fit. Because if you look at the clinical studies, they're, you know, they're all uh, HA compared to placebo or HA uh, compared to another HA, right? But that's not real life. That's not the real world. So we did a use analysis uh, amongst a, a number of surgeon experts, and I was on this uh, panel, to really look at the research and understand where HA fits and did the research uh, answer some of the more fundamental uh, clinical questions that uh, we often have. And so when we look at patients with mild to moderate OA or severe OA, we thought the literature uh, supported this. When you looked at symptomatic adults with moderate OA that have in inappropriate or incomplete response to other treatments, we thought uh, the research supported the use of HA. But in some of these other categories, the research simply doesn't exist. Right, so where does HA fit in the context of patients with meniscal tears, post-traumatic OA, inflammatory arthritis? You know, we still don't have the answers for that. And so again, it's up to you and, and your clinical judgment to see if you think these injections fit. But we felt, uh, you know, for kind of the more uh, bread and butter uh, neoA patients, the literature really supported the use of these injections. So how do HA injections stack up against steroids? So this is a nice uh, study done by uh, Dr. Banneru looking at various trials and comparing the impact of HA uh, injections to steroids. And what they found is steroid injections do quite well early on, so right after the injection, as we see clinically, right? Oftentimes, I give my patients the steroid injections, they feel pretty good within a day or two, especially with the analgesic. But the problem is after four to six weeks, they start seeing that the, the impact starts wearing off. Versus on the NEOA patients with HA injections, they have a much longer benefit. So you see here, uh, before six weeks, essentially, steroid injections win, but then after six weeks or so, you start to see that steroid injections start winning and have much longer uh, prolonged benefit and relief. This is another study I was involved in, uh, looking at the impact of uh, HA injections in patients that had uh, knee replacements. So this was a large database study uh, with uh, one of the commercial payer databases here in the U.S., and we looked at all the patients that had a knee replacement, and we looked at the HA injections that received, and we looked to see how long it took from the time of diagnosis to a knee replacement based on the number of HA injections they received. And the patients that received five or more HA injections, we found over a three and a half year delay in total knee replacement compared to those patients that never received an HA injection, right? So from a payer perspective, from a patient's perspective, delaying total knee replacement, especially in some patients to allow them to get healthier, allow them to get their diabetes, hypertension, lose weight, get off uh, narcotics and opiates, to really optimize those patients, HA injections potentially have a significant benefit to optimize their surgical results 
by buying the time that we need so the patients can be healthier uh, going into surgery. So this was another study uh, by Banneru looking at trying to answer the fundamental question of which options are the best options uh, for us, trying to use RCTs to create that framework. So it's going to be impossible for us to design the perfect NEOA study, right, where we'd have 10 different treatment options, we'd randomize patients all with mild to moderate OA to get whatever treatment option we want, and then follow them out for 10, 15 years, thousands and thousands of patients to figure out what the best uh, treatment options are. That's unrealistic, and that's not going to happen. And so we know meta-analyses do a reasonable job in terms of pooling data around a singular one or two outcomes and very tight uh, treatment options. How do we structure our research to start looking at multiple treatment options to understand what the best uh, evidence is uh, to guide our treatment. So that's where this concept of a network meta-analysis is starting to gain a lot of steam, is looking at the next level of pooling data to really understand uh, what the larger picture is. So this was a network meta-analysis by Dr. Banneru. They looked at 137 uh, randomized clinical trials with 33,000 uh, patients in it. And the studies really represent all the different, uh, really, treatment comparisons that you could ask for, right? So placebo versus Tylenol, Tylenol versus naproxen, diclofenac versus HA, naproxen versus HA, steroids versus placebo, so on and so forth, right? So this is probably a lot of the permutations that we would uh, look for uh, when designing a study. And what they did was they took all this data and they started comparing the benefit of the different treatment options. And the benefit of a network meta-analysis is to really draw the comparison when there's no uh, RCT necessarily between, between uh, two treatment options. So if you look at the impact, for example, of uh, Celebrex and uh, Diclofenac versus Celebrex and Naproxen, right? You can see that there was no head-to-head -head study between Diclofenac and Naproxen. So can we use the information between Celecoxib and Diclofenac or Celebrex and Naproxen to make that uh, comparison between Diclofenac and Naproxen? Right? And so that's the benefit of the network meta-analysis to start connecting the dots and really allowing us to understand what the differences are and what the comparison is between various treatment options that we otherwise couldn't design or don't have an RCT uh, to explain. And so what did they find? They found Tylenol was no better, or actually not as good as intraarticular placebo. Okay? In general, pills did not do as well as injections. Of the pills, diclofenac performed the best. Of the injections, intraarticular hyaluronic acid injections did better than steroids. So let's pick this apart a little bit. I think we all realize and know that Tylenol works, right? I mean, we all take it uh, for ourselves, uh, and we know our patients take it, and, and it works. So how is it that Tylenol doesn't uh, work as well as intraarticular placebo? So I think we'll all agree that Tylenol does do something. So then what does that mean? Does that mean intraarticular placebo maybe isn't a real placebo, right? So is intraarticular saline truly a placebo? So the two pictures you see on the left is a knee scope. On the top is the synovium as they came into the knee scope. You can see it was red, beefy, angry looking, right? We did what we did. We uh, cleaned out the meniscus tear. And then I came back to that same exact spot in the knee. I didn't touch it. I didn't shave it. I didn't do anything to that particular spot. But I came back to it about five, 10 minutes later after surgery was done, and look at what we see. The inflammation is completely gone. So for that particular area of the knee, what happened? I basically just flushed saline there for about five to 10 minutes, and that inflammatory process was gone. So now you start seeing what the impact is clinically of intraarticular saline or placebo, right? So is it truly a placebo, or is it actively doing something, right? So now when you look at some of the older HA studies, you do HA, in a patient with bone-on-bone -bone arthritis or severe OA with intraarticular saline, which is truly not necessarily a placebo, you start to see how the research starts getting very complicated and you have trouble really understanding what's causing what. And so uh, you have a framework now of really understanding you know, where HAs fit in the context of all the other treatment options that are out there. And the research around HA injections is from a basic science perspective, from a clinical perspective, from what we see during arthroscopy. You can see it, it's pretty compelling and a, a fairly useful uh, treatment option in the right patients. So let's look at some uh, case examples here uh, from my practice. 
So this is an example of x-rays uh, from one of my younger patients. Uh, this is a 49-year-old active uh, mil duty uh, military patient. She had some anterior knee pain, occasional swelling. As you imagine, active duty, really high impact activities. Uh, she'd been taking over-the-counter medications that weren't working uh, and uh, had a busy lifestyle. Doesn't have time uh, to kind of stop in my office every week uh, to see me. So these are her x-rays on the right. You can see the merchant view on the top left. Patella looks pretty well situated. We got reasonable uh, looking joint space between the kneecap and the, and the groove in which it sits. X-ray on the top right is the notch view, the flex notch view, Rosenberg view, or tunnel view. Uh, reasonable looking joint space, maybe a little narrower on the medial side compared to lateral side, but overall uh, looks like a fairly healthy knee. Maybe some mild uh, joint space narrowing, uh, KL1, uh, uh, based on the uh, bottom right X-ray, which is the standing AP knee X-ray. Uh, again, no osteophytes, a little bit of subchondral sclerosis, and the lateral view uh, really unremarkable. So this is a healthy, active patient. Anti-inflammatories, over-the-counter treatments aren't working. Doesn't have time uh, to keep coming back to the office. Knee sleeves, things like that uh, don't work for her. So what's the next option? I could potentially give her a steroid injection, but young and healthy, I want to try to preserve that cartilage. right? I don't want to do any more damage than I have to. And so with her, I elected to use a single injection HA product. Why? She doesn't have time to come back week after week. Uh, she's busy. She's got a working career. It's very hard for her to take the time off. We gave her a single injection HA uh, called Duralane, and uh, she did extremely well and basically comes back every six months or so for a repeat injection. This is another patient, 69-year-old patient, a lot of co medical comorbidities, uh, diabetes, so I'm worried about uh, the uh, systemic hyperglycemia as it relates to steroids. He's got peripheral vascular disease, hypertension, recent uh, heart surgery. He has uh, pain with stairs, stiffness with sitting. Uh, again, given his medical history, has limited access uh, to over-the-counter medications like NSAIDs. Really, Tylenol is uh, the best option he has. You can look. We just looked over the research. Tylenol isn't that great. So, again, he had uh, very limited relief with uh, over-the-counter options. And so, for him, again, not interested in multiple injections uh, week after week. Uh, he's not the healthiest guy in the world. He doesn't have easy uh, transportation to get to my office, as a lot of our uh, older patients uh, struggle with transportation. So when he does get there, he's asking for the best option. I don't necessarily want to use steroid injections. So again, for him, single injection HA got him the relief he needed without burdening him uh, with coming back uh, week after week uh, with some of the other HA options that are out there. So again, Depending on your patient, depending on the profile, the medical circumstances, so on and so forth, HA injections can be a really uh, significant benefit to the patient and really help the knee prolong its lifespan uh, so they get the most uh, benefit uh, out of their treatments. So there are numerous non-operative uh, options for the management of knee OA. You should really progress uh, through them in a deliberate, uh, methodological uh, way so you end uh, at the right option for the patient. Recent studies uh, suggest that uh, steroid injections uh, within three months of uh, joint replacement may potentially increase the risk of infections. However, there's some conflicting data around this. A lot of surgeons now uh, don't want to give injections uh, within three months of the total knee replacement. HA uh, injections have been shown to be effective, uh, non-operative uh, treatment options for a lot of patients. And again, single injection HAs are just as effective as uh, multi-injection HA provide a level of convenience uh, for the patient, uh, especially the ones uh, that struggle uh, with transportation and things like that. So thank you for your time. I uh, hope you learned uh, something around uh, NEOA, HA uh, treatments, as well as a whole host of other NEOA uh, treatments. Uh, have a good night.